Hello, everyone. Good morning from New York City. Uh, good evening to everyone tuning in from India and hello to everyone else all over the world. We are so excited to have you here. Um, my name is Kate. I am the editorial coordinator for 1804 Books, a community bookstore and press here in New York City. We are based at the People's Forum. We have a lot of courses, art classes, a cafe, of course the bookstore itself, concerts, all of that stuff, both virtual and in person. So if you're ever in town, come check us out. And if not, we welcome you to check out our website, follow us on social media, all of those things. I'm excited to welcome you to today's event, This Fire Never Dies, One Year with the PKK with the author Frederica Geerdink. She spent a year in, with the Kurdistan Workers Party, the PKK, meeting the fighters and talking to their leaders about their ambitions and their political views. She'll be in conversation with Vijay Prashad, who needs no introduction, but I'll give a short one anyways. Um, he is a writing fellow and chief correspondent at Globetrotter, director of Tri-Continental Institute for Social Research, and author of countless books, both available here at 1804 Books and at Leftward Books. In that vein, I would like to thank our co-host for today, Leftward Books, based in Delhi. Um, they support us in countless ventures, both um, coordinating tonight's event, of course, publishing tonight's book, and you know, just general comrades in the struggle. So I would like to welcome Vijay. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks a lot, Kate. <clears throat> Great to be here uh, on the platform of People's Forum, one of the most tremendous educators um, you know, around and of course, to be in conversation with Frederike Gerdink is a great pleasure. Um, before I, I, I throw the first question to you, Frederike, I just want to say that uh, I came upon uh, your work, her work, depending on who I'm addressing now, your work, Frederike, I came upon your work um, when you uh, were reporting from Turkey about the situation of the Kurds, uh, uh, a struggle that I've been very interested in and we'll talk more about that. And had first gone to Turkey to report on this in 1996. Um, I read your book, The Boys Are Dead, which I thought, um, you know, was a tremendous account of, uh, of violence in, um, in, in Eastern uh, Turkey, which, you know, this is the kind of story that <clears throat> neither gets reported much in the so-called international press, nor does it get the kind of let's call it, um, you know, uh, sensitive attention that it deserves. People actually died um, and innocent people died. And, and that's what I mean, Frederike, you, you brought a kind of sensitivity to the fact that real people died. These are not just, it's not just a, you know, one half column story somewhere in the newspaper, real people died. And you took great interest in going and, and, and seeing what the aftermath of the massacre meant to families and so on. I, I found it to be an extremely moving and important book. The boys are dead. Well, then uh, you had this year in 2015. I mean, what a year. We'll come back to that. Um, obviously, we know the Turkish government extremely sensitive about any reporting um, regarding the Kurdish question. We're going to come back to that. But um, you, you published a book 2018 in Dutch. Um, a book I, of course, couldn't read. And I think that's one of the reasons why I wrote to you and said, please write a book in English about uh, about this. And, you know, we got this tremendous book, which is a translation from the Dutch. This fire never dies one year with the PKK. I think this is one of the best books um, written about the PKK in, in its contemporary period. But also, I think it's a good model of how to do that kind of journalism. So, Frederike, with that, welcome to um, Leftward Books, the People's Forum, 1804. I don't know how many sponsors we have, but welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for organizing this, you and, uh, and the People's Forum in New York City. Thank you very much. Well, they're a tremendous team, Purva Shah, Winnie, Kate. They're a tremendous uh, team of people. I, I love working with all of them and, and so on. Let's get straight to, um, to, to, to your work. Um, you know, you're a journalist. You've been at this for a while. How does a journalist um, from Europe, well, we can have a discussion later about Turkey's role in Europe, but how does a journalist from Europe get interested in the Kurdish struggle? How did you get interested in, in what's happening amongst the Kurds in Turkey? It, it was based in journalistic curiosity. Because the book you showed, uh, The Boys Are Dead, is about um, a massacre that happened at the end of 2011. 
at the Turkish-Iraqi border. Um, there's always been for decades smuggling going on there by Kurdish citizens. And um, that night, the Turkish army bombed the smugglers and 34 people died, most of them underage boys. And I went there for a news report for a Dutch news agency, and I wrote a story for a Dutch youth magazine. And I returned to Istanbul, where I was based at the time, with many more questions than answers. And I didn't understand what happened there. And, and I decided to go back and find out because you said like it doesn't get the sort of attention that I gave it in general in, in international media because they have this, um, this way of telling these stories like um, the people in the village say this happened and the state said that happened. And then as a reader, you still don't know what happened. Who is right? And I couldn't tell the first time I was in the village. Um, the people said this happened because we are Kurds. And of course, that's an interesting answer, but something that a journalist has to investigate. Why are people saying that? And also they said, the, the state said it was an accident. We thought there were PKK people. And the, and the villagers said, that's not true. We've been smuggling there for, for decades. Our ancestors did it too. Um, and the state knows that these parts are used for struggling and not for PKK fighters to cross the border because it's not even suitable for guerrilla fighters to, to cross the border there. So I needed to investigate because I was, I was you know, thinking what happened, what happened. And, and the more often I went back to the village, the more it became clear to me that if I would explain this massacre properly, then I would be explaining the whole Kurdish issue in Turkey. People in the village would also connect it to massacres that happened in the, in the 1930s in Turkey. Um, and they connected it very much to their identity as Kurds. And I wanted to, to explain that and, and unravel it. And, and sometimes people say that um, it became li like I, I sort of chose the sides of, of the Kurds, but that was not what I was doing. I was really doing journalism, who is right? And it turned out the state was lying and the people were telling the truth. And if it had been the other way around, if a PKK fighter had been hiding in that group, if there was, you know, convincing evidence that it was a mistake, that the state didn't know, I would have written down that, you know, but it turned out the state was a liar. So I write it down. You know, just to, to go back to the actual smuggling paths and so on. I mean, I, I know that area, particularly from the t Iraqi side of it. Um, you know, the, the smuggling, of course, as you said, is very old. But after the 1991 Iraq war, the, the U.S. war in Iraq and the creation of the autonomous region in the north, the smuggling really picked up. I mean, you know, it, it really picked up because, you know, you know, you go to any Middle Eastern country and it's uh, consumer goods are Turkish, um, biscuits, yes. um, you know, even, you know, Turkey is in, was in a sense, the China. Sugar and flour and everything. Everything. And, you know, the, the most stunning thing are biscuits. Um, all the biscuits are, are Turkish. And, and I remember in, 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 in Erbil and places, all the shops had Turkish goods. And some of this stuff does come across those, those mountain tracks. One of the most affecting parts of the book, of you know, that book was the um, description of the drone footage. Um, you know, talk a little bit about that because, you know, I know from WikiLeaks and so on, watching the leaked footage from the helicopters, you know, in, in New Baghdad city and so on was very moving for people. But yeah. the drone footage from that incident is very, I mean, you write about it with feeling. Tell us a little about that. Yeah, that, that I started the book with that because, because of what you say, because it was, it affected me so much what, what could be seen there. I didn't see the footage myself because it was, um, it's, it's not open access or anything. But I interviewed people from the parliamentary commission that sort of investigated the incident. Of course, there was no real wish to find out what happened, but there was um, a commission. Um, 
And one of the people in that commission uh, was Ertrugel Kukchu. Um, he's an, he's an, uh, a veteran of the, of the Kurdish political movement. He's a Turkish person himself, but he's been in the leftist movement in Turkey for a long time. Um, and he said, what you see when the bombing starts and how you can tell that these were, that, that any drone operator could have seen that th these were civilians is that when the bombing started, what guerrilla fighters would do is spread to try to get the casualties, to keep the casualties as low as possible. They would spread quickly. But what these people did, they grouped together. They held each other. They tried to, I don't know, that's what they did. They were scared and they grouped together and held each other. And, and then more bombs came. So that was very, one of the things I, even when I tell it now, I feel, I feel the shivers, you know, they were grouping together. There were no guerrilla fighters. Everybody, anybody, everybody knew. You know, the other word for that is they huddled together, um, mm -hmm. like seeking warmth on, you know, on a cold day, they came together like children in a playground, Yeah. Um, you know, like penguins standing at the edge of the ice. They stand close together. I remember reading that and, you know, Ertugal is an extraordinarily uh, a man of great feeling and compassion. And, you know, I've interviewed him many times and he's a very sensitive person. And, and I felt that um, it's a good indicator of, of, of what we as, as reporters do. We seek out um, the facts, of course, but also, you know, we have to really understand human behavior. And in this case, that you described it very well. You know, you're as a gorilla, you're trained to do certain things. And as human instinct is actually the opposite, uh, yes, exactly. together, uh, yeah. you know, and so on. Um, and in a sense, that's what the you know book "This Fire Never Dies" is also about. I think, okay, fine. I published this book. It's one year with the PKK, but it's not really one year with the PKK. It's one year with the Kurdish people as well. And I, I want to ask you a little bit about that. You, you know, you 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 do this this uncovering of the massacre. You know, it's a brilliant. Uh, forensic uncovering of a massacre and so on, but then you continue with the story. And obviously you develop a certain compassion for, um, you know, what the Kurdish people are going through or, or their world, as it were. Tell us a little bit about that, because um, that's so much part of a reporter's life. It's getting embedded in a culture, not just a politics. Yes, I've in that way, uh, going to the PKK for a year, was an extension of, of my work in um, in Southeast Turkey or Bakur, as the Kurds say, North Kurdistan. I always I always traveled around um, in in that region. I lived in Diyarbakir after the after the massacre that uh, that the book is about. I I decided to move to Diyarbakir for like three four months to do the final investigation to be able to finish the book. That was in 2012. Um, and then I decided to stay because there were no foreign reporters based there. They only come from Istanbul or Ankara or even from abroad when there's, you know, when there's trouble, when there's Kurdish New Year, when there's elections. But there was nobody on the ground and I, and I thought that was necessary. And also Kurdistan uh, in Turkey is very, very political and I am too. So it was really very in, inspiring and, and I felt part of part of a community somehow. Um, and this traveling around was to tell to tell the story of the people and how the politics affected them. I did sometimes um, interview politicians in, in the HDP, for example. Of course, uh, the, the ruling party wouldn't talk to me, but um, I did my interview requests, of course. Um, you know, you never know when they say, yes, come, <laughs> come to the palace. Of course, they didn't. Um, but only through, through the people's eyes, I think you can tell the story as a journalist because they are affected and, and politicians always have like, okay, now I'm talking to that journalist now to that medium, always because they have a message to tell. And that's also with the Kurdish politicians, of course, I talk to that one or to that one and they are not, not like traditional power politicians, but still looking through the people's eyes is important for me. So then Turkey kicked me out in 2015. And after that, 
like two months after that, I was in the Kandil Mountains where the PKK has its main bases for an interview with Jamil Bayik, one of the two mm -hmm. co-leaders in the mountains. And I was waiting for him to arrive and it was November and I was looking out over this valley and it was so beautiful. And I really felt I wanted to stay, but I thought, I'm not a guerrilla fighter. What am I going to do? And I thought, oh, I'm a journalist. How cool. I can stay here as a journalist and stay for a longer time and then write a book about it. So I was waiting there with the, with the press officer of the PKK. And I said to him, like, hey, you know, I immediately shared it. I said, I have a crazy plan. And he said, oh, we like crazy plans. You know, tell, tell me about it. So I said, what if I come for a year and... And, you know, do the same thing as I did in Southeast Turkey, which is not talk again to the leadership because I'd done that several times. And I, and you sort of get to know how they speak, what they say, how they think. I can do that again and again and again. Mm -hmm. But why don't I apply the same strategy and talk to the average fighters? Like the normal, the normal fighters in camps all around where the PKK has bases, and and talk to them about why they joined what their aspirations are what daily life looks like and and live it with them and then they agreed so yeah let's go back again uh, because i'm like this frederick i like to spiral you know but not in a straight line yeah um, good yeah so <laughs> what's the problem that the kurds have with turkey like what's the problem um the problem is that they um, they can't be who they are. They are not acknowledged as even existing. Everybody think knows that they used to be called Mountain Turks, and that's not the case anymore. Um, but but still, the whole well to to say it very short, Turkey is a fascist state. Turkey is a fascist state, and you have to all be the same. And even if you're different, you have to be the same. And Kurds don't accept it. And since uh, there have been different uprisings and, and resistances in the, in the um, history of the Republic, next year the Republic of Turkey exists uh, 100 years. So there have been, uh, there's been resistance and uprisings. And the latest uprising, you could say, with the foundation of PKK, and, and this growing into a big people's movement started in the 1970s and it's still ongoing. Um, and they don't accept it anymore. They just want their basic rights. They want to, to live their political rights, their social rights, their linguistic rights, everything. And the Turkish state does not give any space for that whatsoever. Even when you look, for example, at the... Um, so-called peace process that happened between uh, 2013 and 2015. Um, and also before that, Erdogan has, like he would phrase it, like give the Kurds rights, but it's not for him to give, these rights exist. Um, but everything, all the, um, all the things that Kurds, that changed for the better for Kurds, were never rooted in law or in the constitution. So it could also be turned back again. And that is what happened, actually. And, um, and that is what people sometimes fail to see. Like I even read some, some time in a, in a quality paper in Holland that in 2015, um, Turkey and the PKK were very close to a, to a peace deal, which is totally not true. They were, there were ne negotiations going on and there, there was some kind of a framework um, in very much, in very vague speak about decentralization and women's rights and different things. But there has never really been a conversation about what it means to solve the Kurdish issue. And that means totally overhauling the whole constitution. The constitution is about being a Turk, about Turkishness. You have to be like 
Kurdish was never explicitly banned in Turkey. People think like it was in the law book, you cannot speak Kurdish. But that was not the case because Kurdish and Kurds didn't exist. You can't ban something that doesn't exist. The way they did it was everything has to be Turkish. So if you do something that is not Turkish, like speaking another language or demanding um, education in another language than Turkish, it would be separatism because there is a, in, in, Kurd, in Turkish nationalism, there is a historic sort of bond between, um, that's how they explain it now, since they have to acknowledge that Kurds exist, um, a, a brothership between Kurds and Turks, that they share a religion and they share a history and, and a culture. And if you don't acknowledge that, if you say we have our own history that is partly different, we have our own heroes, we have our own language, we have our, our religion is many Kurds are Alevi Muslims and within Sunni Islam, you have different schools as well. Mm -hmm. And many Kur Sunni Kurds uh, belong to another school in Sunni Islam than Turks. But if you point that out, then you are breaking this brotherhood that Turkish nationalists say exists between Turks and Kurds, and then you're a separatist. I sometimes compare it to, like Turkish nationalists also say, oh, but I'm not against Kurds. I have Kurds in my family, sort of an equivalent of white people saying, I have I have black people, I have black friends. Um, if, if I'm not a racist, because, and something like that is in Turkey also, you know, um, I've, I'm a gray wolf, I'm an, an extreme nationalist gray wolf, but Kurds are my friends. I have Kurds in my family. So they, but that means that they, um, they can accept Kurds if they are Turks, if they acknowledge this unity. And if, if not if separatism, and India, separatism is of course terrorism. So there you have it. Yeah, it's really interesting that you mentioned the thing about, um, you know, whites saying I have black friends and so on, because so much of what one experiences in the Turkish dilemma, let's call it that, is in a way the dilemma of, of modern nationalism. Um, you yeah. know, I mean, Turkey, after all, comes out of the Ottoman Empire where they had a plurinational system uh, and you create this national system and lo and behold, it's a genocide against Armenians. Mm -hmm. And then yep. an inability to deal with the Turkish minority and so on. Um, I mean, look at what India is going through today uh, with the mass anti-Muslim sentiment generated by the government and the inability to deal with minorities. Yep. You know, uh, somehow nationalism has this problem with minorities and so on. You know, interesting way, Frederike, the Kurdish question is made even more complicated by the fact that the minority of Kurds is actually multinational at the same time as there's a demand for plurinational. I, I found that interesting that, and, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about that, how um, it's not just the PKK, but all the Kurdish political organizations that at least I've encountered, they'd go back and forth between a desire for either autonomy or linking up with Kurds in other parts of the Middle East, you know, in Syria, in Iraq, in, in maybe even in Iran, although that's a whole other thing, um, you know, somewhere between autonomy, creating a Kurdistan and having more democratic rights within, say, Turkey or within Iraq and so on. Uh, there's a real range of political debate and take us a little bit into that, because even in the PKK, it's not clear exactly what the end goal is. Well, that's interesting because, um, of course, Turkey, the, the Turkish state says it is separatism. They keep saying that the PKK is a separatist, separatist terrorist organization. That's that's the that's the set phrasing. But they are not separatist. They they don't strive to found an, an, an independent Kurdish state because they think the state is the core of the problem. In the beginning. In the 1970s, they did want a state, but in the 1990s, it started to, the paradigm started to change. And um, they want to um, dem democratize. 
in in all the countries where Kurds live, but like in the whole Middle East, not just the countries where Kurds live. Um, and still they want to democrat democratize Turkey. And also, for example, in Syria, they want to make Syria more uh, like a more, and not like a democratic country because it's a dictatorship now. Um, but they want to do it by decentralizing and by very far going decentralization, even on a neighborhood level. So you make communities where people govern themselves and in the, and for example, in Northeast Syria, um, there is no, not a constitution, but sort of a social agreement that has the, the rules that, that these communes have to abide by, um, have enough women's representation and also enough men's representation, because if you don't say that, then the women are going to take over. Um, but also respect for the different communities who live there. So if there is a village in Northeast Syria that is mainly inhabited by Arabic people or by Turkmeni people, then they will have um, a, a big place in the local communes as well. And if there's a group of people who speak Armenian and they want a school in Armenian for their children, they can do that. So they want to respect um, these rights. Also in Northeast Syria, they have three languages Assyrian, uh, Arabic, and Kurdish that are used in the administration. And by, and by doing that, um, you sort of, in the, in the long term, the more you spread that in practice, you will undermine the state. You sort of render the state obsolete. And that is, um, then you still work within that country, but you weaken the state sort of from within. And um, and then Kurds will have autonomy, but not in a, like a Kurdistan. You can say Kurdistan, but what what Kurds call, for example, North Kurdistan, Turks call Southeast Turkey. I'm sure there are Armenians who say this is West Armenia. And um, some people said it used to be Assyrian. It's all true, and everybody can say that. It's fine. Name it how you have, how you want to name it. That's why also in north uh, in northeast Syria it used to they used to call it Rojava. Rojava, Rojava means west, West Kurdistan, but they changed it in, into autonomous uh, regions of northeast Syria because they said we shouldn't call this West Kurdistan because there's Arabs here too and Turkmen and Armenians and for them it's maybe not Kurdistan. So let's stick to Syria, but in the meantime, undermine this whole state structure by organizing ourselves on a on a on a far-reaching decentralized level. So that is, yeah, yeah, I mean, also, yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. another dimension too. I think um, because it is also about being a Kurd. Of course, it's not that that they want to in this way. Um, make Kurds or Kurdish culture invisible or something. That's of course totally not the case. It is, um, when I started my year in the PKK, I was very much um, curious about violence. And I had all, kind of, all kinds of questions about it. Also about, for example, one of the concepts that I found very interesting when I started was revenge. Um, because that's also a re recruiting tool, of course, to to um, to see how how PKK fighters they share footage of attacks on police posts on army vehicles, and and that is recruiting people. But I learned along the way that revenge is much much bigger. Only a part of the fighters is going to carry out such such actions against the state, but revenge is a much bigger thing. It is, it is building something that is radically different than anything the state does. So you're not even striving for a state. And, you know, the first three months in the PKK, I spent in a Kurdish language camp where a few other foreigners were, but also fighters who, who had not been able in Turkey to properly learn their mother tongue. Maybe they could speak it, but could not write it, could not read it. 
So they, they learn their mother tongue, they learn their own history, they learn like, um, and build, build the structures like in Northeast Syria, and they've tried to do that in Turkey as well, help build the structures that are radically different than the state. And that is, that is actually the biggest revenge. And to try to, to pull yourself away from everything you've learned in the state um, and to really think from another perspective. And that is what I've learned in, in this year in the PKK too, to pull myself away from those questions too. And I saw that, that doing this, in the beginning I thought, okay, Turkey can throw me out, but Kurdistan is bigger than the part occupied by Turkey, so I can go to, to Iraq and to Syria. I hope one day to visit Kurdistan in Iran. But later I thought, this is sort of my journalistic revenge. So I, I took a different approach, like revenge is always seen as a violent thing, but that's also a very patriarchal concept and to build something better. So I thought that's my journal, eventually, you know, that maybe I should look at it like that, but the book is my journalistic revenge. You know, uh, you've said a lot of interesting things there, and I want to come back to Kurdish culture um, because I think that there is, um, there's a lot of illusions about, about the Kurdish movement that I get occasionally from people. You know, this idea that, that um, that Kurdish culture is more emancipated than other cultures, you know, is more democratic or, or um, you know, is is somehow secular in, in a way. Yes, the PKK is definitely, um, in, in a way, a much more advanced uh, cultural formation. I'm not talking about politics. Um, you mm -hmm. know, in the PKK, I know that I've experienced there's much more uh, insistent uh, insistence on women's emancipation uh, in the PKK, there, there are conversations about decentralization. I don't want to even romanticize this because it's very difficult to actually produce decentralization fully in an armed struggle. Um, you still have centralized military authority and so on, and, and that exists. But nonetheless, I also found Kurdish culture, uh, because we inherit things from the past, to be very conservative. And, you know, there is there are forms of Islam that are practiced among the Kurds that are terribly uh, sexist and patriarchal and so on, which is why, in fact, the uh, the Kurdish, uh, 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 you know, population, some of them end up voting for the right, the Turkish right, um, you know, including the AKP. Now, we can say, OK, all those votes are fraudulent or whatever. I, I'm not sure because I think there actually is a support base for Erdogan amongst the Kurds. And, and I want you to reflect a little on that because I find it very frustrating to get this sort of Rojava t-shirt wearing people who have yeah. a fantasy about the Kurds, you know, but those of us who have been amongst the Kurds know it's a much more complicated situation. Could you address that a little bit? Yeah, it's very interesting. And no, the, the AKP does not have support among Kurds because of photo fraud. There is really support for AKP. And partly it's because in the beginning when Erdogan came to power, it, it, there was some hope that he could solve the problem. So, you know, let's vote for him and see what he can do. And, and it seemed for quite some years that he would actually do something. So, you know, that's not so very surprising. Um, and yes, Kurds are um, often, it depends a little bit where you go, because, for example, in, in Dersim, um, officially called Tunjili, if people want to look it up on the map, don't look for Dersim, but for Tunjili, that's another story. Um, they are uh, Alevi Kurds, which are not so conservative at all. But if you come to Hakkari, um, Shirnak, where the massacre happened, Van, Diyabakar, there is definitely conservatism and conservatism and um, still very much an old clan culture. PKK has un undermined it, but it's, it's of course not, you know, eradicated in, in, um, in a generation. But recently I, I found um an analysis about that which i found very interesting um also about the alevi kurds who have who are one of the groups that in turkish history have have 
resisted very much. And it has to do with different identities and how they relate to power. And if there is, um, this was a, a Dutch, uh, Dutch Kurdish woman who said this. Um, she said, if you have different, different identities and you are suppressed, one of those identities is suppressed, then you often see that the identity that is not suppressed, that people link themselves to that identity to um, be connected to power somehow and to gain something from that power or to feel stronger. So if you are a Kurd and you are a Sunni Muslim, then your identity as a Sunni Muslim is close to power. So you connect to that power to, to strengthen yourself, to, you know, to have some some place in society. And that is why Alevi Kurds are so much, are, are even more like a res the, the resistance from that group has always been strong because they have no connection to power. They are Kurds and they are Alevis. So they have two identities that the state doesn't want. So they have no identity that can relate to power. Maybe the men can, of course, in patriarchy. But some of the women that are very important in the PKK, I, I mentioned Jamil Bayek, he's the co-leader with Bessé Hozat. Bessé Hozat is a Alevi Kurdish woman from Dersim. She has no connection to power whatsoever. She's a woman, she's an Alevi, and she's a Kurd. Who is she going to connect to, to make a connection with power? Nobody. And I found that very, very interesting. Um, and that is... Um, you know, I'm, I met, you know, that is part of the um, reason why, why women would be attracted to PKK, because they also have, maybe they are um, Muslims, Sunni Muslims, and can relate to power like that. But in a very patriarchal society like the Kurdish one is too, what, where are you, what are you going to connect to as a, as a woman if you want to resist? then the PKK is quite a logical place to go. And, and I find, well, logical place, it is, I recently published something too about, you know, why, why people joined. It's, is it logical in the Kurdish context, you know? Um, like, how can you, I don't know if you remember this, this woman in my, in my book called Hebun, Hebun meaning, meaning existence. She, she was forced to marry when she was underage um, to a man who, who was, you know, barely an adult himself. They had, I think, three children or four. Mm -hmm. But she had rejected the marriage from, from the very start. And she left her family to become a PKK fighter. And she said... Um, this is the biggest thing I can do for my for my daughters, but for my son as well. This is the biggest resistance that I can wage as a mother. And that was very profound and also very, I don't know, from 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 a perspective in which, you know, motherhood is everywhere in the world, but definitely in Kurdistan, very, you know, close to sacred thing going away from there but she was very strong i looked at her eyes when i interviewed her i thought do i see any you know do i see the the pain of leaving her children but i didn't really see it and i asked her about it like doesn't it you know i i don't see any tear i don't see any and she said a woman who cries can't achieve anything I don't know. It really stuck with me. It was a very, yeah, profound um, testimony that she gave to to the patriarchal society that she came from, and how she felt that she could resist it. Um, th that's very moving, and and you know, I've I've had similar conversations in different places. Um, you know, for instance, I had interviewed Victoria Sandino, who was a leader in the FARC in Colombia. And I met uh, Victoria uh, around the um, peace negotiations. 
and I asked her, you know, Victoria, what, what's the first thing you'll do after the peace accords are signed? And she said, you know, I'm going to go to this town in uh, southern um, Colombia and I'm going to go and find this young girl and I'm going to tell her, I'm going to first embrace her deeply and then I'm going to tell her that the last thing her mother told me when she died in my arms was to go and see her. And I, I found that so moving. And what moved me about that was that, you know, many of the FARC people that I've interviewed, very rarely do they actually want to be there in the jungle. Um, almost none of them want to actually be carrying a gun. Um, these are political people. They want to produce a different world. They don't want to be fighting. You know, I that I did find. No, to be honest, I found some gangster type people there also. Um, <laughs> you know, who are drawn to uh, the guerrilla movement because of the guns. Okay, fine. I, I admit that there are people like that, and and quite a lot of them. Um, but the bulk of people I found were like Victoria Sandino. You know, who who actually was not afraid to cry. And and it, it may also be a cultural thing. Um, yeah. You know, she was not afraid to cry and she was a commander. And she said, this is terrible and we are fed up. And we want to be back above ground in politics because there's no substitute for above ground politics. And, you know, now she's a member of a party called Comuna in, 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 um, in Colombia. And they are going to participate in the presidential election in March. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to go all out for... Uh, Gustavo Petro, who is running from the left and has a good chance of winning unless they again fraud the election, which is likely. Um, you know, in your book as well, I felt that these are very sensitive people. And I also felt that there is a misunderstanding of armed struggle. And I want you to tell us a little about that. You've already <clears throat> talked about, well, you know, there's a Kurdish language camp uh, over here and somebody else decides I want to go and join the FARC. But most people who are in the FARC aren't roaming around with guns, firing at drones by the Turks. They are in, in Istanbul, um, in, you know, in the slums where there are millions of Kurds. Uh, and the PKK also is not just a Kurdish movement, as I found in even as long back as 96, that there are lots of non-Kurds in the PKK and it has a kind of different platform. Tell us a little bit about what these PKK quote-unquote fighters are up to and what do most of them do and what's their day like? Well, the, the weapons are, um, many fighters told me, I, I, I felt the need to ask in the beginning, like, when would you lay down your weapon? Um, and they said, like, I, I don't know, the weapon's not that important, you know, and I was surprised in the beginning, but the weapons are for self-defense. Um, and self-defense is a is a natural right, you know, acknowledged in our laws too. If somebody attacks me, I can I can defend myself, and you know, it's 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 legal. So they see it too. Like uh, we defend our um, our culture, um, we defend ourselves against actual um, armed attacks by the state. So it's self-defense. Um, but there is a lot of education going on. Like, like I said, you know, it's three, three months in language camp, but the education is everywhere. Also, I was in, um, in Shengal in Northwest Iraq, where the Yazidi genocide happened in 2014. And, um the the kurdish fighters of the of the peshmerga they left when isis approached and genocide began and pkk um came there to to you know try to save as many people as they could and they were rather successful in that and there was still a front line when i came there which was twice once late 2016 and then again in the spring of 2017 and also there, the education was ongoing. There's always education everywhere. And there's education for new recruits, which is partly armed, but also ideolo ideological. But at the front line with ISIS, I follow the course in women's history. And that's one of the courses that um, it's like 
um, one of the one of the teachers who is also a fighter um, it gives a class, but then there's discussion about it too. And you can follow this education um, throughout the years that you're a PKK member. And the education is often the same, but you, you, you grow as a person. And then if you follow that course again at a different location, you will pick something else from it. You learn something else again. Um, so education is, is very important. Um, there was a lot of waiting as well. I was, I was north of Raqqa because Raqqa, uh, ISIS was still holding Raqqa at the time. And I arrived at the front line when there was a pause in the fighting and they were re regrouping and, and then also education was going on, but also just, um, I don't know, people were being together also. Um, being at a camp, I don't know, just the daily chores as well, cooking, cleaning, washing the laundry, um, you know, repairing clothes, making new uniforms, things like that. And one of the one of the funny things actually at the the women's history course in in Shengal, where, where ISIS frontline was, there was a of course a cigarette break, and I was talking to one of the men who were in the course, and. And I sort of just to make conversation, I said, oh, that's nice. We're following a women's history course here. And I bet these ISIS guys are not having such courses. And he immediately said to me, like, did you have such a course then in your high school in Holland? Hmm. No, I didn't. <laughs> so sometimes I learned a lot from small casual conversations, which was precisely what I was trying to do to get these because when I finally um, when it was late May 2017 I knew I was almost going like back to Holland again and it felt like I can I can leave if I leave now I will never be able to return I can maybe visit PKK base again, uh, as I had done before, but I can never stay the night and, you know, sleep outside the barracks with a row of women and, and wake up with the sunshine and, you know, bake bread with them and, and whatever, and really be part of this life. And, and that's, I shared that with the commander there. And she said, that's, that's, she felt the same about her old life. She said, I can never go back to where I came from. It's really a, a very radical break with, with the system that we all live in, which, which is also not like if you've, if you've seen that and if you've learned so much, it's also not that easy to, to leave again and to, to, um, to think about what my new position is going to be, because I already told you about the, the the parallels I see with, for example, racism in in the society I live in now, in my homeland in the Netherlands. I I learned to look not only in the PKK but in the years before that in in Kurdistan too. I learned so much about my own society and about power, how 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 you can look at society from a different perspective. That now I'm trying to still trying to find out like what is my position here as a journalist in the Netherlands, as a white female journalist in the Netherlands, and there's a there's an upcoming and you know upcoming rather st strong anti-racism movement in the Netherlands. How how can I contribute? That's that's been my main question ever since. Like how can I contribute? And I want to return to Kurdistan. I haven't been because of the pandemic. And as a freelancer, I have to protect myself very well from this virus. You know, I can I can be sick for two weeks, but if I have long COVID, it's going to be a big problem. So I've been, you know, not traveling since the pandemic, but I want to again. But I'm I'm so trying to reflect on my position 
and how I can I've I've learned to look at Turkey through Kurdish eyes. But now I want to look I've I've learned to look at the Netherlands through through the eyes of marginalized groups in the Netherlands. I haven't learned, I'm learning and trying to find out what my role as a journalist can be. And and I'm very thankful for the Kurdish movement for that, but it's also like I'm I haven't I haven't made up my mind yet. It's a constant, constant <laughs> like thing in my head. Yeah. Well, you know, there's there's two things. You're raising two big questions. Let's take them one by one. You know, one is the question of um a person living in in a you know in a integrated world, let's call it, integrated into the into the mainstream world, um, makes a break, political break, and decides to go to this um, this non-mainstream, disintegrated world of a camp um, where they are, you know, trying to build a new world. I, I accept that, uh, and but nonetheless, the new world is not actually going to be completely built there because you're a small number of people, and there are, you know, hundreds of millions of people at your door who live in another world. Um, and we have seen over the, the course of the last hundred years that apart from, you know, just a few uh, struggles of this kind that have actually triumphed, um, just a few struggles of this kind that have triumphed, most people at some point have to reintegrate. But what I find interesting is that um, it's not just the PKK again, it's the HDP and it's all, it's a range of other political forces in Turkey um, are also building democratic structures, um, not just in the mountains, but in the cities, in the slums, and so on. Um, and lots of very brave PKK people are underground, as it were, uh, you know, in Istanbul and in Ankara and in Diyarbakir and so on. Um, everywhere. Everywhere. And I mean, you know, uh, I, I once uh, was somebody was telling me, you know, again, a non Kurd was going on and on about how the Kurds are going to create a autonomous region in southeastern Turkey. And I said, just a minute, you know, there may be, in fact, we don't even know the correct numbers. There may be more Kurds in Istanbul than in the rest of the country, you know. So take it easy, you know. Uh, uh, what would you like to do? Would you like a massive population transfer? Grotesque, grotesque. Yes. My family left, uh, you know, uh, Punjab, uh, in 1948, actually, not 47, and traveled to what became India. You know, 13 million people were moved in the partition of India. One million people died just in the partition. One million people died in that partition. 13 million people moved. I am fundamentally opposed to the idea of population transfers. You know, we want a plurinational system. Seems to me that's what, in fact, these political forces in Turkey are trying to build is a plurinational system. The HDP, you know, the, the the Democratic Party is not a Kurdish party. It's a party of a plurinational Turkey. So tell us a little bit because it, it doesn't actually belong in your book as such, but I know you have a lot of experience on it. Tell us a little bit about that wider sense of the PKK politics. Yeah, it's true that you know, that's one of the problems, of course, if you erect a independent Kurdish state, what are you going to do with Istanbul? That is in the most, the, 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 the city where the most Kurds, with the biggest Kurdish uh, population is Istanbul, not Diyarbakir um, or Erbil or any other city. Um, and population exchange, yeah, that's another word for ethnic cleansing, isn't it? And uh, Turkish uh, Turkish history, um, there was a population exchange between Greece and Turkey uh, when Turkey was founded, and that you know, population exchange is not the word. I think it's a it's it is an ethnic cleansing. Um, and in the um, if you have a decentralized democracy, then then the the neighborhoods where Kurds live would have their neighborhood uh, democracy. Um, and would have to say something about how their neighborhood is run and which schools and which language are, is being educated there. And, and I think one of the things that comes to mind for me is um, South Kurdistan, 
which is Kurdistan in Iraq, which does aspire to break away from Iraq, which is not very realistic um, at the moment, but they've had a referendum in 2017 and, and the leaders are, you know, advocating for that. And, and I think it's, it's rather dangerous, actually. I cannot, you know, if people aspire, you know, who am I, but I'm to, to say to be against it or, you know, in favor of it. But I'm trying to think what could the consequences be? What if Turkey would say, okay, now there's a Kurdistan, you can go there. That is an, that is an actual danger. That's what happened when, you know, when the borders of the Turkish Republic, as we know it now, happened with, with, with Greek people who lived in Anatolia. Now there's this Greece, go. And the Turks who lived in Greece can come to Turkey. So the danger is that, that, that Kurds in, in Turkey um, are supposed to go to what is then the Kurdish state. Um, with, you know, with borders that are, that are not, um, there are several borders, you know, partitioning Kurdistan in four countries in, in Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. So you have to, you don't have to, but it would be an idea to eradicate those borders in, in the way that I explained before. You are waging your struggle inside this country that you're in. You're, you, you don't intend to break away and, and set up a different nation state, but render these borders ineffective. And that can make a circle with the smuggling that we started about in my previous book. Kurds don't call it smuggling. They call it cross-border trade. And when I first started to go to this village, I thought like, yeah, cross-border trade, you know, it's smuggling. That's how we know what you're doing. Um, and I thought there is sort of, I, I didn't like that phrasing of cross-border trade, but then they are trading with people who are part of their clan, part of their family. And they are just, you know, separated by a border that isn't even theirs. So you can call it smuggling and make it very illegal. But for them, it's not illegal. It's doing, it's, it's making trade with your next of kin, literally. And smuggling renders it very, yeah, illegal and something the state has to, and, and now uh, often the, the uh, cross-border traders, the coal bars, they are called from Iran, Kurdistan and Iran are shot by Iranian border, border guards um because of the illegal it, because you know it's illegal to to smuggle but yeah you have to um the pkk and the kurdish movement is about acknowledging the kurdish uh existence but it is fundamentally like in the core a struggle for all people it cannot be, it can, per definition, not only be for Kurds. It must be for all the nations um, that are living in the lands that Kurds also call their own. It's, it's, in the, it's in the heart of the project that it is for everybody. You know, this, also, also for Turks. This idea of borders is always interesting. I mean, you know, we're talking about, you, you use the, I, I like that idea, cross-border trade. That sounds like a World Bank idea. Uh, rather than smuggling. It's just cross-border trade. Well, you know, think about the U.S.-Mexico border. The United States first seizes one-third of Mexico. You know, that's Arizona, uh, California, um, you know, New Mexico, te te part of Texas, and so on. One-third of Mexico was seized in 1848. And now, you know, families that actually straddle the border cannot meet. Um, mm -hmm. It's the same in, in so many countries. We forget that this is actually a foundational problem in the United States. It's not just a Turkey problem. And yeah. the kind of, I just read a book about how U.S. Border Patrol essentially funnels people into um, the, the, the valleys of death where you will die because of the heat. Uh, rather than having to shoot them, you just let them cross into these valleys where nature takes its course. But they're being funneled to die, you know. 
it's a brilliant book by written by an archaeologist. Um, it's the same in a sense in what Europe is doing, and this will come back to you know one of the last questions I have. You know, I visited Agadez in Niger. Um, you know, it's an incredible. The Sahel region is incredible. And you see, you know... You mean Agadez, like the southern European border, you mean? That's exactly correct. Um, yeah. And, and it, it, what was stunning to me was I, had, I was sitting in the International Organization of Migration, you know, compound, talking to people, talking to officials, and, you know, not officials, but really the kind of people who provide social security. Um, they are out there checking to see if everybody's got water. And, you know, they try to facilitate a transfer. They can't stop, you know, frankly. And one of one of the people hanging about, they said, hey, listen, let me take you to show you something. So I said, OK, we went and he showed me the world's largest drone base. This is a U.S. base in Agadez, in the town, which is the world's largest drone base. I didn't even know it existed. Up the street at Arlit is a massive French foreign legion base. Now, they are all there saying we are here to fight terrorism. Actually, they are there to prevent um, people from moving northward to the Mediterranean. And, and it's harsh. I mean, you know, they are harsh. They are, they are tough people out there. And the sovereignty of those countries has been totally vitiated. I mean, you know. Really, Mauritania, Mali, you know, Mali right now is facing so much anti-French sentiment as a consequence of this. It's not just Turkey. That's what's interesting is this is a kind of problem everywhere. And I'm pivoting to the last question I wanted to get in with you, which is you had mentioned just now, you know, what do you do? You're, you're you know, you're a freelance reporter. You're in the Netherlands. Um, you're getting involved in these anti-racist kind of stories that are, I think, really important to document. But it seems to me these are all the same kind of story. Um, it's a story about people who are not being allowed to live. And, you know, you're not telling a different kind of story. Have you been doing stories also? And, I, and I, I'm asking this to some extent because I think it's important for people to to, to, to acknowledge this, you know, have you been looking at the stories of the migrants from um, Turkey as well and also Kurdish migrants in Europe and what this is meaning for them in their lives? I haven't really been traveling to, for example, Greece to report about that. Um, of course, when, when the um, what we call refugee crisis happened in 15, um, I was still in Turkey. I was thrown out in September 15, and that that was really like heavy. I couldn't really immediately make up my mind and think, "Oh, something happening there." I can, you know, make a, a shift my attention to that. And then I went, of course, to PK for a year, and it took me a year to write the book. And I've not had a home for a few years, so I was constantly relocating from one friend's couch to the other. Um, and now I haven't been writing about that either. I've made uh, stories in the Netherlands, um, also about undocumented people here, for example, but not really been that much um, at the borders of Europe. But one of the stories that, um, that recently happened were the Kurdish um, refugees from Kurdistan in Iraq at the Belarus-Poland uh, border. And and what I found very interesting was that um, it, Belarus um, president was blamed totally for that situation. And of course, he did um, facilitate these travels and bring people to the border and did that to destabilize uh, Poland, EU. But he could only do that because of how Europe is behaving and how, how closed Europe is. And it makes me furious, really, to see how we are um, building walls. We are literally building so many walls around Europe. And it's going to be our, it's, it's, it's now the death of the people who want to come here. But it's going to be our death, too, because if nothing that closes itself off from the outside world is ever going to survive. It's our own death as well. So yes, we see Lukashenko there. 
but what we see is Europe. This is Europe. And it's infuriating me. But what I, I, I can connect this to something that I've learned in the PKK because when the peace process fell apart in, in Turkey in the summer, in, in spring, summer 2015, I was also frustrated because, as a journalist because I thought if this leads somewhere and if the Kurdish issue is solved, maybe I can um, report from the Black Sea coast, which is considered to be very na Turkish nationalist and see how a new Turkey affects the, the, the identity of very nationalist Turks. That seemed to be an interesting project to me. And it wouldn't happen. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to report like on the, on the new Turkey because it's not going to happen. And I talked about it with a PKK fighter and, and asked him also, like, like um, this is not going to change in the short run. So what is... What is your motivation to keep going? And he said, but you you look at it in such a small time frame, he said. You know, our lives are very short. And maybe he was convinced, we didn't even talk about capitalism yet, VJ. How did that happen? <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. We're, we're talking about said, writing about people. I think that's important, yeah. Yes. But he said... Um, Capitalism is eventually going to fall because it is not, it, it's not feasible. It's not, you know, it, it must, it is definitely going to fall. And maybe not in our lifetime, maybe in, in not the, the generation that is born now, but eventually it will fall. And we're working on laying the foundations for a different society so that we're ready when it falls, that we are ready. Like they were ready in Syria. They thought they were going to build autonomy in Turkey, but then the Syrian war happened. And Assad withdrew his troops and they thought, shit, we're going to have the opportunity here. So they started building there. So there, and he said, maybe by the time capitalism and the nation state and patriarchy falls, maybe PKK doesn't exist anymore. But um, somebody, some other group will have taken over and will advance the struggle. And we are part of the, the, the groups that are laying foundations for, for a new system. Um, and that, and that helped me a lot. And I also, it helped me also in the way that I thought I'm going to write this book. I'm publishing about the PKK now, and hopefully, um, at some point, um, people will read it again. Maybe, you know, just, um, what if people read the book in 100 years or in 200 years? I don't know how things look in those days, you know, if paper paper books exist or I don't know. They read about it and maybe they think, oh, this Geerdink, she was there in, 20, in 2016, 17. That's a long time ago. Look, the PKK still existed. And I thought, hey, I'm here now. The people who founded it move, this movement are still alive. I'm talking to them. That's very cool. I'm here now. And maybe there's not going to be peace now and, and a better society now. But yeah, I'm here. I'm here now. And that's very cool, too, in, in, in this long struggle. So that, uh, yeah, that, that helped me um, as a journalist, as a person, you know, it helped me a lot to, to look at it that way. I mean, part of our job is to document and chronicle um, events, also to to see how um, how things are um, you know contradictory and and complicated, and you know uh, you know you and I are not writing political tracks alone. We're also writing these texts, which uh, where there is an allowance for nuance and complexity and so on. And and I think that one of the the features of of um, you know uh, this fire never dies is that every section is extremely small and the book is extraordinarily readable because not only does it chronicle the struggle well it can be read and it can be read easily so I'm going to ask people um, to get a hold of uh, this fire never dies you can get it from leftward books leftward.com you can get it from 1804 books in New York um, it's available all over the place thanks to the internet. And it's true, a book like this will be read in whatever form books are read for a long time. 
not because you know i'm saying to you frederike oh you've written a classic i don't want to um, get you too excited but because it's an well, i have well you have it's, it's an important <laughs> book about an important struggle and it's also a struggle that's not just about um about you know about the kurds and turkey although it is and i think people need to pay attention uh, to the kurdish a uh, quest to produce a democratic middle east um can i can i add something too please. because i see the the line underneath uh 1804 books can i can i also mention that people who are interested in following the news in kurdistan i have a weekly kurdistan newsletter export kurdistan it costs less than a cup of coffee per month people can subscribe via my website frederikegeerding.com there's a button uh, newsletter um every sunday you get a solid update from every part of kurdistan and exclusive content so if people are interested i can direct them there that's excellent i mean and 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 you sh- and people should if, if not only if you're interested in in kurdistan affairs but also as i said in the fate of fate of the planet it's pretty bold stuff but that's where we are you know the pkk is of course an anti-capitalist anti-imperialist force it's an important force but it's not the only one uh, either in turkey or or amongst the kurds uh, but it's one important one and people need to to pay attention to it. it's been a great conversation i'm going to ask sudanwa from leftward books to come in and i very much hope that kate purbasha and vinny will also join us for a few minutes uh, so we can say thank you to you frederike for writing a great book and for for coming on with us today so so kate can you bring in uh sudanwa yourself vini uh, purbasha everybody yes please sudanwa thank you yes. thank you very much to vj for for uh, organizing this to get this together with the people's forum very and very very much thanks also for publishing the book as a dutch author it's not that easy to find an english language publisher with um, a beautiful cover by the way very yes, the cover is cover. stunning definitely uh, i love it i love yeah. it very much yeah and i just want to say that the next time you write a book on the pkk or something else we are always there for you frederike thank um, you very much it's been a privilege to publish you uh, because you know there are two kinds of journalists in this world uh, there's one type which is a essentially they are uh, they're the puppets of of the powerful they are like ventriloquists you know dummies uh, they speak things that they take down in press conferences from the powerful from the rich and so on and that's the narrative that they push the other kind are are journalists who 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 go to the people uh and listen to the people and are open to um open to contradictions uh to nuance uh and to people's voices and we've been uh, incredibly uh, um, you know lucky to have had this conversation between two such journalists my dear friend and comrade vijay uh, and of course frederick uh, whose pu- whose book this fire never dies we published from leftward books it's available as vijay said from the leftward.com website as well as 1804.com website uh, so i would encourage uh, those who are listening to go and get a copy i'd like to thank 1804 books for partnering us uh, in reaching these books uh you know all over the world and a huge thanks to the people's forum for organizing this wonderful wonderful conversation it's been a real eye opener thank you so much frederica thank you all very much too really i like the conversation too it's it's really nice to to talk to somebody who has who understands the mindset because that's not always the case when i'm interviewed about the book so this this gives it much more depth and i like that very much thanks thank you so much everyone get the book <laughs> and have a good day bye, bye.